You're now listening to Chris and the Badger, a presentation of the self-hosted podcast with Chris. A lot of options out there, but you can use this stack. I've tested this. I've refined it over the years. And Alex. I, d- I don't think there's a better solution, really, if, if you're willing to put the effort in. And featuring special, special guests. guests. Morgan the Doorbell Guy. Wes Payne. And RV. JDM. What? Jonathan from Unray. Uh, hang on a sec. This goes on for a while. Here, leg. And your hosts, who are celebrating episode... Oh, come on. Hey, tank. All right. And Jeff Gearling. Okay, now your host. Snap Raid and Merger FS, and I endorse this media server build here. Celebrating episode number 50. A long-term relationship with Sync Thing. I think, what else could I do with it? And that single spark is a huge rabbit, rabbit hole. hole. Huge rabbit hole. Huge rabbit hole. Chris and Alex. Well, welcome to episode 50, everybody. I hope you liked our special intro to celebrate the 50th episode. Yeah, that's great. Congratulations, Alex, to episode 50, and thank you to all oh, yeah in our Discord for making that awesome intro. Now now he's got to make a special edition show themes all the time. That was amazing. And it's here, Alex, 50 episodes, and it takes a while when you're doing them only twice a month. It's been a long haul. Yeah, 50, huh? It means, uh, what, nearly two years of, of doing this with you. And to celebrate, we've actually got some merch available for the first time. <laughs> this really was all really driven by Alex. He wanted to see this done. Of course, I wanted to see it too. But Alex really took the lead and made sure we got something special for you guys for episode 50. We have it up at jupitergarage.com. We've got a couple of special shirts, a Chris and the Badger shirt. And a self-hosted logo shirt, if you'd like that. And we also have a couple exclusive stickers, a self-hosted square sticker, and of course, a Chris and the Badger sticker, which would look great on your machine, I gotta say. Yeah, I think it would too. I mean, I uh, I think it was when Drew, who's our editor, sent me a, a, a little electronics project full of parts, and it said, to the Badger on the corner. I was like, ah, <laughs> oh, we need to lead into this yeah. a bit more, don't we? Yeah, we are leaning into it. <laughs> I think with episode 50, we're just like, we're doing it. We're doing it. And it's because, you know, people kind of came together and helped us make it special. So that's up there right now. And if you are a self-hosted SRE, one of our members, then check out the post show and check out your member feed. We will have a special promo code for you to take a little bit off the uh, gear. But it's all actually at a really great price right now. We're basically running it pretty close to cost as it is because we just wanted to have something special out there for episode 50. So all of it is up at jupitergarage.com. If I could just take a moment to interject and just say a huge thank you personally to all of you for listening to all these episodes. It's a real privilege to do this show with you, Chris, but also be able to present to the to the audience that we have who engage on Discord so well and on Twitter and all that kind of stuff as well. So it's been a huge privilege for me and a, a big, a big thank you. And we want to say thank you to a cloud guru, the leader in learning for the cloud, Linux, and other modern tech skills. They have hundreds of courses and thousands of hands-on labs. So go get certified, get hired, and get learning at a cloudguru.com. Well, I'd imagine that you're still rebuilding from the great flood of a few weeks ago. How's that going? It is indeed an ongoing process, Alex. <laughs> we'll just say that, I guess. Uh, I actually did pick up a couple of uh, quick tips that I'll share uh, in a bit in the show from this entire experience. So I guess there's a bit of a silver lining there to it. But I haven't replaced everything. I have successfully saved a couple of items. So that's awesome. But for the most part, I'd say like 90% of everything was a loss. <laughs> Damn. I mean, I hope you had insurance. Well, some of it's just old gear, you know. Some of it's just old stuff like chargers and, and whatnot. I suppose I could probably try to do the insurance thing. I have a box in the attic full of old English for some reason. They made it across the channel. Uh, channel? Ocean. I have a box full of English power adapters. And so they're, they're the sort of things that just hang around forever. So maybe it's a good thing that you douse them all with, you know, 17 gallons worth of water. Yeah, and I do need to kind of like change up my charging situation. Because see, what I got going in this area is a charging station, you could say, for all of the kids' iPads and switches and controllers. And so this whole situation has actually inspired the wife and I to cap the water pipes at that area, remove the faucet completely. And then after we get back on the impending Denver road trip, 
we're going to build a shelving system in there where the kids can slide their devices into shelves and they'll have power cords pre-run. So the whole the whole incident's actually inspired us to really kind of up our game instead of just having like this loose area where we stash stuff near a sink. <laughs> but it just took the disaster to kick our butts into gear, I guess. You know, one of these days I might convince you to get a 3D printer and custom print the right size inserts for the devices and there's been a couple of fixes and a couple of projects for this road trip a couple of times now because this is one of the bigger trips because we're going to be on the road for probably about 40 days straight if you think about that in terms of just wear and tear on a vehicle and the house box that is running on top of that vehicle that's a lot and so there's been a lot of things we're doing to prepare for it and i've thought a couple of times a few things i'm replacing like trying to get a magnet on my door so that lines up with the sensor and trying to just position that magnet just right. If I could have built a little 3d housing for that to just position it where I needed it, it would have been job done. It's on my mind. It may happen. You have a few options of cheap 3d printers. I mean, there's a Prusa one that's uh, the Prusa mini. It's about 400 bucks delivered. Ender make some Creality makes some as well, but I, uh, I had bad experiences with, with the Chinese printers and personally, I'm a huge fanboy of Prusa because they open source everything and nine times out of 10, the print just works, uh, which is what I'm in 3D printing for. I'm not really in it to tinker and 3D print new parts for my printer. I want to print cool stuff, you know, so. I just figured I'd wait for you to upgrade your current rig and then I'd buy this one off you used. <laughs> <laughs> that does tend to happen. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But we will be in Denver soon. We're going to have a meetup. Alex is going to be there running trivia night so go to meetup.com slash jupiter broadcasting i think it's august 20th a friday that we're going to be in denver doing the meetup there's also a meetup coming up in salt lake city just only i will be there alex won't be making it to that one but details for that are at meetup.com slash jupiter broadcasting it's gonna be weird getting on a plane i'll tell you that how long of a flight is it to denver for you guys Mm, about three or four hours i think it really is just the perfect midpoint between you and me isn't it it's like right there smack dab in the middle Yeah, it's either that or the middle of Arkansas. (laughs) Most of the crew is flying out, with the exception of myself, of course, my wife, and Brent. Brent, you know, from Brunch with Brent, is flying into Seattle, and then he is going to caravan out with the family and I in Lady Jupes. Oh, I'm so jealous. Like, Brent is a precious resource that we have to share out carefully. <laughs> we do, yeah. Yeah, well, he'll have his fill of us, I think, by the time. We're in the- <laughs> I mean, you know. It's actually going to be pretty great. The kids are excited. This is going to totally, this is going to, like, enshrine him as Uncle Brent at the end of this road trip, you know. So that'll be pretty great. And I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I'm extremely jealous of that. And uh, I really, I hope you have a, a great time on the road. Uh, I've always wanted to do Salt Lake City. I never quite made it that far north in Utah. We did uh, Arches and Dead Horse State Park and that kind of stuff near Moab a couple of years ago. Uh, That was amazing. If you're ever in that area, amazing, amazing stuff. Absolutely love it. Totally. You're absolutely right. It's like another world. It feels like you're on a set of Star Trek when you're in Moab. Mars. You know, Salt Lake City was a promise I made to the audience because it's not like exactly on our way to Denver, but I, I made a promise to the audience that when we could, we'd return to Salt Lake City because we had to skip it. We had a whole thing planned. We had to skip it. So this is making good on a promise to the audience in Salt Lake City. Perhaps this is a an, an entirely gross misrepresentation of Salt Lake City, but it's kind of colored to me by the Book of Mormon, if you've seen that. <laughs> no. uh, I mean, you know, it gets a lot. It, actually, just sort of tangentially related to that, when we were trying to book a venue, we had to listen to a whole bunch of rules about alcohol that we have never had to sit through from any other state. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. Well, when you've had one too many beers after a meetup, the last thing you want is to be fumbling around for a phone in your pocket or trying to remember what voice command you programmed into the lady cylinder this week. Have you got a solution to that? I had a fire tablet that worked pretty well before it got water destroyed because it fell out. It was off the wall. It, it fell into the water bath. Uh, but also, you know, Brent's going to be on board and he doesn't know all those special commands and uh, he's going to want to control things. So I wanted to get that tablet on the wall replaced, which runs my home assistant dashboard 24 seven because it's, it's it makes it easier for the family and it makes it easier for guests. And yeah, it makes it easier when you just can't remember what, you know, what did I call that group of lights again? I can't remember. So at a bit of, I'd say maybe laziness and at a, a bit of budget concerns, I've been picking up the Amazon Fire tablets and I don't really want to invest in a 
system where I need to reflash these things. It's not that I'm against it. I used to love doing that. It's just kind of, it, it crosses an effort line for me that I'm willing to put into this kind of device. Beyond that, I'd rather just get like a used iPad. Well, we talked a little bit about flashing lineage on to my old Kindle Fire a little while ago. Right. And for me, it's just, it's just not quite worth the effort. The tablets kind of suck already. And so if I have to do all this extra work, it just, it kind of like loses the value for me a little bit. I wanted to see if I could find a nice sweet spot where I could still pick up a Fire tablet for a great price off of Amazon and then just easily and quickly modify it for my needs, which is mount it to a wall and run Home Assistant dashboard all day. And so a couple of projects that I found made it exactly what I was shooting for, that kind of like that sweet spot in the middle. And I picked up a 10-inch Amazon Fire tablet. I opted to go for the ad-free one because, again, I'm not going to reflash this thing. But if you were going to reflash the thing, you could you could save a few bucks and you could get the version that comes with ads <laughs> on the lock screen, which is so obnoxious. In fact, I've bought the no ads version in the past and still received the version that comes with the ad. So I could totally understand if you wanted to reflash it. But I that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to use this app that I found called Wall Panel. It's an Android application for web-based dashboards like Home Assistant. Like that's what's in a lot of their screenshots. And you could sideload it if you want, but they've also submitted wall panel to the Google Play Store and to the Amazon App Store, which means it makes it stupid easy to get it up and going on a Fire tablet. It has really great fast camera motion detection too, so now what I can do is sleep my screen, and then when the front-facing camera detects motion, it wakes the screen up. And that's actually surprisingly handy. You approach the tablet, and as you're approaching it, the screen just becomes available. And then I have it set to like a three-minute sleep window. You can have a pin code option in there to kind of lock the screen out if you don't want to just give anyone access to your dashboard. And with the ease of access and in installing this thing and the power options for keeping the screen awake and all that kind of stuff, it gets me 90% of the way there with a stock Amazon Fire tablet. So it's wall panel. I'll have a link in the show notes for that. So what if I did want to reflash it or tinker with it? What can I do there? There are a couple of options there. The one that I think I'd recommend, like the next step up from wall panel, you may have seen this over at the XDA forums. It's called the Amazon Fire Toolbox. And this uses the Android debug bridge to apply tweaks to the Fire tablet from completely reflashing them to just doing things like maybe installing Google Play or removing some of Amazon's annoying software that's on there to just completely replacing the version of Android, if you like. The downside is you got to use Windows, and I just don't really have access to a Windows machine. It's a Visual Basic app. They say they're going to work on Linux support, but Datastream33, who who kind of hangs out over the XDA forums, he's a senior member over there. It's his project or their project, and they're a Windows user right now, so they're making it for Windows. (laughs) So it's not really something that I have quick access to, but the idea is you plug your Fire tablet into your Windows box, you load this toolbox up, And then that gives you a GUI with a bunch of options in there that just kind of can go in there and lobotomize the Amazon stuff out of the tablet if you want and give it actual genuine Google Play Store APIs. And who doesn't want to lobotomize a tablet, huh? (laughs) Well, I mean, have you seen the nagware they put on these things? They They want you to buy everything that Amazon makes and they want to turn it into an Alexa and they also want you to turn it into an audible station and they also want you to turn it into a prime streaming machine and they put all this stuff all over it and i just want it to run one single app you know i I was worried about this kind of thing um because in in days past you had to root things and reflash bootloaders and that kind of stuff and i i read a long time ago that warranty claims were refused if people had done modifications like this to these ad supported devices do you is that still the case now So the nice thing about the toolbox that we were just talking about from XDA, um, that's not messing with like the system restore partition on your Fire tablet. So you could go in there and like lobotomize the Amazon stuff out of the image. And then if you needed to reset it to factory defaults and it just restores it to a stock Fire tablet. So your warranty is good if you just did that before you sent it in. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's just software, isn't it? I mean, unless there's like an intrusion detection in the firmware. I don't see how they'd ever know. Well, they could, yeah, they could do that, I suppose. But thankfully, they're not. Um, But that's where wall panel is kind of this nice starting point. And you could just start with that for these on-wall dashboard. Because this is, I think, such a great way to make 
home automation more accessible to your family is a visual way for them to control things. And with the Home Assistant dashboard setup, you could make it something really appealing to people, and it renders really great on a 10-inch tablet. And Wall Panel has an option to turn on by default when the tablet boots. So it kind of just launches immediately and kind of papers over all that Amazon stuff. And it, <laughs> it really gets you like 90% of the way there super quick. What's the last 10%? I think the last 10% would be replacing the OS. You know, because then you could put something a little more modern on there. Because Amazon's Fire Android OS space is often behind mainline Android. Well, yeah, I mean, I saw today just in the JB Telegram chat that people were talking about the, uh, I think it's like a 12-year-old Kindle is getting internet access revoked or something by Amazon, turning it into e-waste, essentially. You know, that's a tricky one. The cellular networks eventually get shut down. I think that thing's like on the 3G network or something, right? Because it's... It's pretty old, I mean. Yeah, eventually they got to shut down the network, but that's, it really kind of does make you think, like, if you want something to last a really, really long time, you got to look at ways of self-hosting it. And maybe some, some devices just aren't, aren't the right fit. Uh, although you could argue 12 years is a pretty good value proposition when you consider new Kindles are like 100 bucks. Like back then, those Kindles were not that cheap. But new Kindles are a lot cheaper. Well, very good. I think next time there's a Black Friday sale or some kind of Amazon-invented Prime Day thing, I might pick up a Fire tablet and just give that a go. The one that I flashed with Lineage a little while ago has been doing perfect duty, actually, as we've been using one of the Wisecam V3s with that Lineage OS 7-inch Fire tablet from half a decade plus ago as our baby monitor, and it's been working brilliantly well. So uh, you can breathe new life into old dogs with this stuff. As part of the episode 50 festivities, I wanted to complete a project that I've been kind of working on in the evenings, off and on over the last six months or so, which was a searchable archive of our show notes. And huge thanks goes out to the orange one from Discord, who rewrote, I think, something like all but three lines of my code <laughs> to scrape the uh, Fireside website and ingest the HTML and the XML feeds and spit out what eventually turns to, turns out to be an MKDocs-based searchable archive of the entire Jupiter Broadcasting suite of shows. That's so great. And, you know, I, I feel like he kept those three lines of code in there just to be nice to you. But it's so quick and snappy, and it makes it really quick to find stuff that eventually this is going to get integrated into a into the site itself. But for right now, it's just a great way to, like, I know we talked about something. When did we talk about it? Like, it's good for that kind of stuff. I can't tell you how many times a week I get pinged with, when did you talk about X? Or when yeah. did... <laughs> You know, great example is the lineage flashing of the uh, seven inch fire tablet. As we were talking just then, I just typed into the search bar lineage OS and boom, up came episode 44 of self hosted. There we go. Job done. So it's already working for me. Now you can find this thing at notes.jupiterbroadcasting.com. We've got Coda Radio, Jupiter Extras, Linux Action News, Linux Unplugged, and of course, this here self hosted podcast. All right, well, this is the self-hosted show, so you got to tell us a little bit about how you set it up and what's running. Well, one of the coolest things that Orange managed to do was dynamic theming between the different shows. So I don't know if you're on the site right now, but if you click between the different shows, you'll notice that the top header changes. So self-hosted is Orange, Coda Radio. I do like that. Yeah, that's so cool. And Action News is red. <laughs> Uh, it's all backed by MK Docs, and he's done a bit of dynamic CSS switching between the different tabs, which is pretty cool. But what we're doing is we scrape all of the uh, show information that's on Fireside, and we use Fireside as our podcasting publishing platform, and we use that as a source of truth. And this Python script uh, then takes that scraped data, uses what's called a Ginger 2 template to substitute things like the tags in there, the hosts, um, any of the links that we put in the episodes, that kind of thing. And it spits out a plain markdown file. MK Docs then ingests that plain markdown file, and bada bing, bada boom, we have an MK Docs site. Very nice. But we are relying on a small element of non-self-hosted software. We're using GitHub Actions, and we're running it through a cron job, so at 5 or 6 a.m. every day, it just goes and scrapes the JB site. So you'll see that these show notes are getting automatically 
updated. This website gets automatically updated every day. So it's never out of date. Linode.com slash SSH. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit towards a new account, and you go there to support the show. So that's Linode.com slash SSH. And yeah, of course, notes.jupiterbroadcasting.com is running on Linode. Everything we build that we want the audience to be able to use, we host that on Linode because their infrastructure is killer. And the price is great, too. In fact, Linode is 30 to 50% less than the other big hyperscalers out there, and they've been around since 2003 doing this. So for 18 years, they have remained focused on building out the greatest cloud that you could possibly ever want as a Linux geek. I mean, it's like a playground. I go up there, and sometimes when I just want to try out a couple of different projects for talking about on the show, like, how do you know if something is worth proceeding with? Like, this is true for you when you're building out something like you have a project. Like, how do you know if this is the stack you want to use? Well, I deploy it on Linode, often with some of their one-click deployments, and I'll test it out, and I'll run it for a couple of days and see how it works. And Often, I keep one out of two or three things, and that eventually turns into a show. And then we create a project around it, and we end up putting it in production. And the entire time, from beginning to end, we're doing it all with Linode because they just they make it simple, it's affordable, and it's easy to work with the team, too. And then on top of that, they have a really handy API that you can either use directly yourself, programmatically, or do like I do and just kind of take the lazy route and use their command line client. So I'll do this to like pop a file up on their S3 compatible object storage and I can mark it public and generate the URL in like three or four seconds. And this is awesome when we're trying to get clips ready for a show or something like that, or we're collaborating on a project or recently I I sent a big batch of files to somebody and we were going back and forth like, how are we going to even share this file? I'm like, oh, hold on a second here. I'll get you a little zip file with a URL. I did that with a video of my daughter the other day that was like 170 meg to a parent and Telegram was like, nope. So I just used the object storage and it worked great. Yeah. And the command line client is like the pro way to get things up there. Because what I do, because <laughs> I'm such a nerd, is I have a Uwake drop down terminal where it's always like in one of the tabs. So it's like up, up, change a couple of things, hit enter. <laughs> it's great. But all on top of that, they've got cloud firewalls. They've got VLAN support. They have a really powerful DNS manager. They're beginning to roll out bare metal servers. And they also work with infrastructure management. So if you want to plug in with Kubernetes and Terraform, maybe you want to even just use Linux as part of a multi-cloud strategy. They're great for that too. In fact, 66% of companies will save money working with a mix of alternative cloud providers instead of just relying on like one big hyperscaler. So it's worth just looking into that. Linode could be part of your multi-cloud strategy. And if you ever run into any trouble, you ever need any help, they've got the best customer service in the business. And when your business is running on Linode, it, it's nice to know that's available. And their support for the community runs deep. They're making it possible for our team to get together in Denver. They're making the whole road trip possible. And that's pretty awesome. And not only that, but they're going to be bringing swag and giveaways like raspberry pies and all kinds of awesome shirts they've made just for the trip. And it's just going to be a whole party made possible by Linode. And they're doing that just to have a chance to connect because like us, they miss seeing people. It's it's been a while. And Linode has been so enthusiastic about supporting our reunion. But there's so many things I could go on about. You just got to go check it out for yourself. You just got to, you got to get your hands on it and see it. So go use that $100, maybe learn something, and support the show. Linode.com slash SSH. Now, I came across a thread on Reddit a couple of weeks ago that Shaw, who's an ISP in Canada, was blocking Plex because it thought it was suspicious, which tingled my spidey sense a little bit. Because I often tell people that I share my Plex server with that the ISPs don't care, it's all just encrypted traffic, they have no idea what is going on, right? And so I dug into it a little bit, and one of the comments has some really interesting information about how the Plex web app works, which I thought might be interesting to share with you all. Now, Sure Protected Browsing uses a service called Zvelo, which happens to flag app.plex.tv. And the way that the Plex app works in your web browser is it downloads the code to the browser and then runs it locally. So if you can't access or, or the, web, the web URL is blocked by an ad blocker or some kind of safe browsing plugin, uh, it just can't download the code and you can't, can't run it. And because of this, you know, it could affect things running, uh, you know, a, 
a web app on a TV, for example, might suffer the same fate. And I just thought it was really interesting that these apps aren't local. They're not locally rendered, which is why when Plex update their UI, you don't have to download anything. It, it just automatically happens. Uh, Plex clients for Android, Android TV, iOS, tvOS, etc., aren't affected because they are full versions of the app. So if you have a smart TV or a hosted Plex web um, app.plex.tv, you're probably going to want to find a way to route it around something like Zvelo, which is what Shaw uses, um, to avoid this issue. It's hard to not be skeptical. Uh, safe browsing, this just sounds like they're trying to reduce load on their network, doesn't it? Or perhaps encourage people to sign up for streaming packages. I absolutely find it abhorrent that uh, Verizon or you know, AT&T, they, they all do it here, have different quality profiles of Netflix videos or YouTube videos, and they lock you into certain quality profiles unless you pay them more money. This is one of the reasons I decided to set up my PepWave with, the, with their Fusion Hub VPN solution, because it routes my traffic through a VPN and they can't, they can't tell what it is, and so they don't re-encode the video for me or Actually, what, what AT&T does, each, each provider does a little bit differently. And at and is particularly frustrating because they just sort of brute force it. So that way, the YouTube client and the Netflix client, they just sit there and bang their head against the video streaming service asking for the best quality, and it keeps failing and failing and failing. And then when the client finally to say, okay, fine, I'll go down to the next lower quality, it tries that, that fails. And then when it finally goes down to 480p, then it plays. So you just sit there waiting while your carrier is blocking these connections you wait with your little spinner on the screen it's it's so frustrating and to see Shaw do this for plex it, it really it stinks it stinks because the reality is they know what's going on over that plex port they know it's not some sort of attack or some sort of weird malware they know it's video streaming and my reading of the law is the copyright violation really happens when you download the file I think, I don't know, I could be wrong if anybody wants to let me know in a clear, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old way, self-show slash contact. But my understanding is you're not actually violating copyright if you stream it. That can't be right. But um, either way, I don't know how Plex scoots around that particular issue. But regardless, it's not Shaw's place to enforce copyright law. Uh, it's just not, or, or IP law. It's just, they should just be passing the bits. Yeah, I mean, I don't expect my water company to choose which bits of water I get. <laughs> yeah, although you do want them to keep the bad stuff out of the water, so that might be a bad analogy. <laughs> you know, I know, Alex, you are you are very organized compared to me in your Plex collection. Like, you have collections for everything. You've got nice, consistent album art. Like, at some point in time, you must have just sat back, had a drink, and spent, like, hours organizing all of your metadata. Well, I am now. This week, I've found possibly my new favorite Plex pick of the year, Plex Meta Manager. This is a Python script, and it is awesome. So this thing will go through using the Plex API of your local Plex server. It uses the token uh, that you can generate by going to view XML and get the little token from up the address bar. And what it will do is it will basically match the uh, TMDB uh, ID of the movie against a list of different collections. So it's built me in my Plex library, for example, a bunch of different collections based on genres. Okay, yes, I already had genre filtering, but this is using Plex's smart search. It's just really cool. You've got to go check it out. I've got now a, a 90s, a noughties, a tensies, a 20s collection in my Plex library as well. It's just really, really cool. But what got me looking at this in the first place was my wife and I were browsing through. I've got oh, a thousand movies or so on my server, and we were just browsing through the other night saying, what should we watch? And neither of us could come to any kind of agreement about what we should watch. I know, it's it's so true. Well, first of all, why don't I have a bunch of collections of stuff that's you know recently added uh, is one thing that Plex does out of the box, but there's no real kind of you know uh, trending kind of collection like there is through the plex meta manager uh, like a netflix or an amazon prime would give me and and with this i'm able to sort of say oh hey yeah that that new wonder woman movie okay cool i could go and watch that tonight huh. 
So that was really the motivation behind it. But this, this script takes a little bit of elbow grease to get set up. The documentation is very good, but it's also very verbose. So it, it almost put me off, but I'm very glad it didn't. You need to configure a couple of YAML files, and then uh, it, they actually provide a Docker container that you can run the Python script out of, which just floats my boat. Uh, I have it set to run every day through a system D timer. And the main reason that actually we wanted to go into refreshing all the metadata every day was because of the critic ratings that Plex has. I noticed that several of the movies that I had, the the critics rating and the Rotten Tomatoes rating didn't really seem to line up with what I thought the movie was, like not even a little bit. And it turns out that it was just a few thousand votes on those really early scores. And so the Plex meta manager goes through every day and refreshes things like critic ratings. It has a cache, which you can configure. And I think I've got mine set to 30 days. So it's not going to go and scrape every movie every day. But, you know, once a month, I think updating my critic ratings is probably worthwhile. So this Python script, you set it up to run through systemd every night, and then it it goes out and gets all the updated information, and then it writes it to the Plex database directly? Yeah. So if you're running Plex in a container, are you running this script in that container, or how's that working? You supply the Plex server URL. So in my case, it was just 192.168 port 32400. So it's talking Plex. It's not like crawling the file system. No. Gotcha. And then how does it get access to the database, though? Through a token. So when you go into your media library, there is a Plex token that you can get. You can click on, I think it's get info, and then view raw XML. And as part of that XML payload, up in the address bar, there is a, it's like a 20 character long token. You give this script that token, and then it authenticates against the Plex API, and off it goes. That is so cool, Alex, man. I love the idea of going out and getting the updated ratings because I have observed that same exact thing and I'm really glad you dug into it because I had wondered how exactly does that work. Um, that is so cool that it goes out there and gets the trending stuff too. I noticed too that you came across Movie Match, which is what I actually thought was going to do some of this. Yeah, it's like Tinder, this thing. Not that I've ever used Tinder because I've been married for 10 years, but... Now you're more of a grinder guy. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. But it is like, it, it's actually more of like, uh, it's more of matching tastes up with a group, right? It's more about like, hey, what do we all want to watch together? And when, again, going back to that problem, when you've got like a thousand movies in your library, it's harder. If a group of us were here in the studio, legitimately, if we were all just hanging out, you, me, and everybody were hanging out on the couch, and we were just flipping through live TV, and like Star Wars was like on one of the cable channels, we would just watch it. There wouldn't even really be a debate. That's what we would put on. But when you actually have to choose and you want a group of people to decide, it's a real first world problem. Misa likes Star Wars. <laughs> oh, no. Those ones even? Yeah. Look, I was a kid when that came out. Episode one, I was, uh, I was like nine or ten oh, when that came up. out. And uh, I remember we were on... This is one for the British audience. We were on a Norfolk Broads holiday and we were in Lowestoft that night. And we all, I remember walking down the road with my dad to go to the cinema, cinema from the boat to go and watch episode one. And it's just one of those things that stuck in my memory. Ah, uh, that's great. How can you not love pod racing? It's just the coolest thing ever. Yeah, that's true. The pod racing was super awesome. Yeah, I mean, I enjoy the Star Wars movies. The prequels, not as much. I think the writing's horrible, but I'm more of a Star Trek guy. I've kind of lost track of what's going on these days. So speaking of this movie match thing, uh, essentially what you do is you and your partner or your group of friends set up uh, this app to talk to your Plex library and it presents you with a random bunch of movies that you swipe right, you swipe left if you like it or don't like it. And if you and your group end up with a common set of movies, it will show you at the bottom, here are the three movies that you all thought were worth watching. So you, you, it just narrows things down for you. You could set up like a group chat, like movie night group chat, and you drop that link in there a couple of nights before and have everybody go through and swipe right and left. And then when it comes time, use the new Plex Watch feature and just watch it all together. Socially distance movie night. Hey, it could be a thing again. And, and now, we, now we have the tools we need. This is really cool. So we'll have a link in the show notes, or you could just Google search for movie match. It's just one word, but links will be at selfhosted.show slash 50. 
Now, my final Plex pick for this week is a no spoilers script. Have you ever been watching a TV show and seen an episode three or four episodes ahead in Plex and you see a character whose current storyline doesn't fit with that thumbnail? Yes. Well, this script will blur out the future episodes you haven't yet watched. That's great. So is it, it must be going through finding that JPEG and actually like applying a blur to it. That's, <laughs> that's funny. That's really funny. It will blur out the episodes based on the user who sets it up. So for example, my server, let's say Catherine had her own account, my wife, all the episodes I hadn't watched would be blurred even if she'd watched them. So it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. Mark my words, Plex will introduce this feature to the Plex client. Uh, my prediction right here on Self-Hosted 50. Because Infuse, the, the, what I've been raving about recently, which is also a Plex-compatible client, does this. It's an option in the settings. And it's a game changer. It's what actually switched it over using Infuse. And now I've just stuck for all of the other reasons. But it, it pre-blurs the image and the description. Once you've watched it, it unblurs all that stuff. And it just goes based on the watch status. And there's just one user with Infuse. But if you are on an Apple TV platform and you want to use Infuse to watch Plex and would like to do that, it's just in the settings. And we love this feature. So I got to imagine this is something Plex is going to implement too, just because it's so freaking handy. Yeah, I'm still butthurt about this NVIDIA Shield update. I thought I'd get used to it and I thought I wouldn't care too much. But I tell you what, my Shield downstairs doesn't have the update, but the one upstairs does. And the one upstairs is really beginning to grate on me. So... I might have to get an Apple TV soon. I want to take a moment and thank our friends over to Cloud Guru for their support. And I want to mention to you, they have a Linux file sharing course. It's a deep dive on Linux file sharing. It's a standalone course, but it's also part of a learning path intended to prepare you for the LPIC 2 engineer 202 and 450 exam. In this course, they're going to cover the basics and advanced configurations for Samba and NFS, including configuring file servers, Exporting file shares, user authentication, client configuration, and mount options. We'll have a link for that in the show notes. Or you can go to cloudguru.com. And also, we have cloudfree.shop sponsoring this week's episode. You can go to cloudfree.shop to get a pre-flashed Tasmo to smart plug. Use the coupon code SELFHOSTED to get a dollar off per smart plug. And of note, the new version 2 smart plug has been released recently. And this one's really cool because it features energy monitoring. So not only do you have a free and open source firmware on this thing from the factory, but I can now also monitor how much power my server is using without needing to tie up my kilowatt, for example. Super cool. So go to cloudfree.shop and use the coupon code self-hosted. Greg writes into the show, Chris and the Badger, love the show. It inspired me to learn Docker this past April and convert all of my self-hosted services to Docker. I built one big Docker Compose that provides the MariahDB for various components, plus the uh, swag and SSL for all my external services. And I've moved over to AirSonic Advanced and BookSonic and Ghost as well. All tips from the show. But here's my question. How do I manage updates for the various service images? Most of the Compose entries are built with the latest tag. Should I move to a specific version and definition and then rebuild it on a regular basis? And for in-container security updates, how often should I repull the images to keep them up to date? Perhaps there is a guide or a white paper on different approaches. I think Greg just needs some help, Alex. Well, my advice would be straight off the bat, don't run latest because it's just a disaster waiting to happen. As I found out with my next cloud this week, which broke again. No, no, no way. Even though I talk about it in the last episode and I've pinned it to a specific version, you know, a, a major version. So 19, 20, 21, something like that. But within those certain tags, sometimes you've got to watch the developers as well, even because uh, they all just released all the security patches and all the updates for the entire life cycle of that major version. So you will get a lot of updates, even sometimes when you pin specific versions. So the only way to be sure is to go to the Docker Hub page for a specific image and look at the list of tags that are available. And some providers, uh, some developers offer specific tags to the exact specific version, which ties to a specific commit. Others like Nextcloud offer a stable version of a major version. Lots of different ways to do this particular thing, but... For apps that don't matter, 
maybe you'll get away with latest. You know, things like traffic, for example, is probably a good idea to run that on latest because that's public facing. So you want the latest, you know, CVEs and things patched in that one. But for the rest of them, I would probably steer away from latest just because at some point or other, it will bite you. Bevan writes in and he is looking for a security camera system for a vacation house. So I think one that he probably isn't intending to be at very often. He writes, most of the options seem to need a cloud component in order to operate, which is a bit concerning since the systems are not cheap to install. I'd be interested to know what you guys use and maybe what other listeners might have installed. Cheers. Love the show. Well, let me just fire up notes.jupiterbroadcasting.com <laughs> and type in Blue Iris, because that's going to be my recommendation. We've got a couple of episodes where we've talked about it in the past. Uh, episode 43, episode 28, 36. And we've talked about it quite a few times. The Too Long Didn't Listen, though, is Blue Iris is a Windows app. So you're going to want to have some kind of a system that has a quick sync enabled CPU. So something like the HP 290 Slim Box, which you can pick up off eBay for about $130 at the time of recording. That has an 8th gen Intel CPU in it, which has Quick Sync. You install Windows on there. Yes, I know. Sorry, Windows. And then uh, Blue Iris on top of that. And then what you will need to power the hardware is a PoE switch connected to PoE cameras. And you can usually get those for anywhere from... 10 or $20 from Alibaba, all the way up to three, $400 each if you want to buy Unify gear. Uh, what I tend to stick with is the price point of around 50 bucks a camera, unless I absolutely need 4K, uh, and then it's about $100 a camera. But uh, it's not terribly expensive. The cameras are the cheap part, essentially. Running Ethernet is going to be something, is going to be something of a consideration because that's how the cameras get their power. And then also you might want to upgrade a couple of things in the HP box are recommended. It comes, I think, the one on eBay with a 500 gig spinning drive, for example. So you might want an SSD for that as well. But that's a pretty solid setup. And there are lots of guides on YouTube on how to set up Blue Iris. And uh, recently they've got some really cool features in there with DeepStack to do object detection and that kind of stuff. So Blue Iris gets my vote. Right. And those cameras going over Ethernet are going to be a rock solid setup. And I think that's really key is a lot of the cloud solutions are all Wi-Fi cameras. And Wi-Fi cameras are going to work 90% of the time. <laughs> but wired cameras are going to work 100% until there's like a hardware failure. Now with Blue Iris, Alex, because I'm unfamiliar with it, is there a remote viewing component so we could pull it up on a mobile device? It's so cool. There's, a, there's an app for all the major mobile platforms as well as a web browser like a web interface so i can just type the u, the url of my server which happens to go through my traffic reverse proxy and straight away i'm thrown into a web interface that is html5 and i can see all six of my cameras boom right there so if i hear a noise or the doorbell goes or something like that i just type in bi.mydomain.com and uh, boom straight in a browser i'm good to go and that's another thing about the local wired systems is those camera feeds are going to come up a lot quicker. The cloud-based systems are going to have to connect to the service first. There's usually, you know, somewhere like on a good day, a three second delay. Sometimes it can be a 30 second delay. I don't like it. Now I normally um, would sit here and I'd tell you about my wise system. I have the W Y Z E cams that are going into a Shinobi box, but I, I don't love the solution because the cameras are not, super reliable. And so I would not recommend them for a security system like what you have here. I have it for we're off grid somewhere and we come back and somebody's broken into our rig. I want to have a good shot that I've caught something on camera. That's really what I have my system for. But it, I don't know if I would trust it to run 24 seven because they're Wi-Fi cameras. They're doing it over RTMP or RTSP. It's just not super reliable. Now I've never used the next system I'm, I'm about to talk about, so I, I would not normally recommend it. However, I have gotten a couple of emails in. People have said that if you want a, a system that's kind of like a midway system, I've heard that the Arlo camera system is good for that kind of thing. You can get it like on Amazon in like a three to six camera kit. And what's kind of different about this is it has a base station unit that the cameras connect back to locally on your LAN, and that's where the video is stored. Um, and so that does seem com um, compelling to me. And I guess it has a pretty flexible setup system. 
and you can get a three camera kit for 385 bucks off of Amazon when it's not on sale. And I don't know if how great it is, but the people who've written into the show seem to really like it. The camera seemed to work indoors and outdoors. Never tested it myself, but if I had 385 bucks to burn, I may give this a go one day because I do like the idea of making this as much of an appliance as I can. And I am not really in a situation to run Ethernet and do PoE. No, I do have a couple of those wise cameras plugged into Blue Iris as well. One thing of note, though, is that the new V3 cameras don't support the RTSP firmware yet. So if you're thinking about getting those cheap $20, $25 wise cam V2 cameras, just uh, just be aware you'll need to put a custom firmware on there. Yeah, my advice would be don't do wise right now. The wise 2 is just not fast enough to do uh, the feed reliably. And the V3, while it has a faster processor and better optics, doesn't have the firmware yet, like you were saying. And I would hold off on purchasing a wise camera system until then, because what I like to do is bring all those feeds back into Shinobi, running on my Raspberry Pi. But with the V2 wises, they drop off several times an hour right now. It's, it's no good. There's gaps. And I think the V3s would be a lot better, but you have to wait. So I'd say, hold up. When we come back on the show and say we've tested it, go for it. But in the meantime, if you can... Wired is the way to go. And don't forget, as we talked about at the top of the show, we have a big Jupiter Broadcasting meetup coming up very, very soon, both Salt Lake City and Denver. And don't forget to go to jupitergarage.com and grab some self-hosted 50 merch for the next couple of weeks. We're running member pricing on the store to celebrate episode 50. So you got a limited amount of time to get over to jupitergarage.com and pick yourself up some stickers or shirts or I don't know. There's all kinds of stuff over there. I'm not you. I don't know what you do. And if you want to support the show, you can go to selfhosted.show slash SRE. I got a memo the other day that we might be doing a special discount for all original merch. That's right. Crazy self-hosted's giving away prices. We're dropping prices. We're slashing prices for members only. We'll have a discount code that will take a little bit off any original merchandise items. And when you go to jupitergarage.com, there's a products drop down menu. And if you choose original merch, Members are going to get a percentage off all that. We'll have details in the members-only post-show coming up. Absolutely. Now, for all the ways to go and get in touch with us, you can go to selfhosted.show slash contact. And you can find me on Twitter at Ironic Badger. I'm there too, at Chris LAS. And this here show, for news announcements and whatnots, at Self Hosted Show. Thanks for listening, everybody. That was a special episode 50.